Okay, welcome to this session, uh, which is about CAL coding uh, for performance. It's great to see so many uh, developers uh, come to listen to what we have to say about NAV uh, 2013. Um, one of the main themes when we were doing NAV 2013 was indeed uh, performance uh, and to really get, get that improved. Uh, and uh, modest as we are, we think we, we came uh, a good step uh, along that road. Uh, and so now we will be uh, telling you something about the changes that we made uh, and how you can actually utilize those. And um, I want to let you know that we have a bunch of uh, T-shirts here that we want to hand out to the most interesting or maybe fun questions that you can come up with. So we do encourage you to, uh, to stop us as we go along and ask if there's anything uh, that we can clarify. And of course, we'll, always, we'll also be available afterwards for questions. So um, this is uh, a brief agenda. I will do some um, uh, architectural overview, basically taking you through the, the bigger areas that we think uh, in, that we have made changes to that we think influence the way you can code for performance in CAL. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say a few words about myself. My name is Lars Hammer. I am an architect uh, on NAV, and I've started working on NAV back in 1992 with the, uh, doing what is now known as, as the classic client or the retired client even. And, uh, have been mostly doing technical stuff in the framework and runtime and all of that, and lately also working a bit more on, on the application side of things, so a, a bit um, all over the place nowadays. And with me, I have Bardur. Yeah, and uh, I'm uh, yeah, Bardur, as you can see, and <coughs> I'm, uh, I've been with uh, Navision slash Microsoft since 97, so in three days, I think, I've been here 15 years. Um, I work with the application, so in that sense I'm like you, or most of you, opposite these two guys who work on the platform. And I, Nowadays I work also on the um, application architecture, you could say. And Jesper? Yes, my name is uh, Jesper Folkebo, and um, <clears throat> my background is from the old uh, Dengra uh, uh, products. So I used to work for on the AX product. I joined the uh, uh, NAV product. I've been working with that, I think, for, for something like seven years. I joined to help with the performance issues. Um, when I joined, I rewrote the, the SIFT system, so some, some of you may know me uh, from, from, that, um, from those changes. Yep. So let's uh, move into uh, the overview. There are five um, different uh, areas that I would like to quickly take you through just to set the stage on what we have done to, to the server, uh, to the runtime. Um, and uh, of course, when we talk performance, one thing that's very important is how you actually get data out of the database. And as I'm assuming that many of you already know, we're introducing a query in this release, uh, something that we'll talk a lot more uh, about, um, and I have a little overview of, of what we've done to, to CAL. So just a little bit of history. This used to be the deployment overview uh, for the 5.0 or the classic release standard uh, two-tier, uh, fat clients doing all of the business logic, and we introduced at some point the NAS, uh, the uh, then called Navision Application Server, which was really just a scaled down um, or a, another client that had stripped just the front of the UI, uh, but basically functioning in the same way. Now that is classic technology, sure, uh, but it's also very simple. And if you compare to the 2009 releases, you actually see that you um, the the uh, the goodness of the three-tier architecture actually came with the price of, of added uh, complexity. What this diagram shows is um, because of this 
mixed mode that we were in where we had to have both the classic client and the NAS as well as the new RTC clients, we ended up having the application server or the NAV server as we now call it where the business logic is executing that needed to do impersonation of the user. So you had a fairly complex uh, setup uh, um, ahead of you there and that server was not able to share resources in the way that you would uh, like to ideally do with a server. Now moving ahead to 2013, we've actually uh, come back to simple, we think, in, in many senses. And as you can see from this diagram, um, we now only have a single account uh, on, this, on the NAV server logging onto SQL Server, um, which means that we can do interesting things like uh, share the connections uh, to SQL Server and, and pool them up uh, and, and do more uh, simplist, uh, simplistic stuff there, um, utilizing the resources uh, better. We've also moved the NAS functionality so that it's now inside of the server. It doesn't have this artificial client outside. It's running as what is known as a background session. Um, and we'll uh, get back to that a little bit more. And then we have, of course, as, as you all know, we, know we, now only, we now not only have one client, we have a Windows client, we have a web client, which is here, and we also have a SharePoint client. And that whole architecture around the client is really coming together, allowing us to add multiple clients uh, also in the future. We've left the development environment uh, pretty much as, is what we, as it was. We've rebranded it from Seaside to development environment because it's not so much about client-server anymore in the traditional sense. So that's the development environment uh, that you see there. Um, that is now strictly a development environment. So it doesn't run any AL code anymore and we don't have forms and classic reports. And another sort of area of focus is that we are now only running on the Microsoft SQL Server. Um, and that actually allows us to um, do a lot of new features on the server, as well as some optimizations, a lot of important optimizations um, we think that you will, you will hear more about. Um, I mentioned connection pooling and we have improved caching in there as well. And of course we have the, uh, the query uh, object and the background sessions there. This is a quick overview of, of the architecture of the NAV server. I'm not going to go through all of the features in there now. We will cover most of those in, in other sessions here. What I will highlight is again that the application can utilize query. A little thing blinking there. And then a very important thing that we did that Jesper will uh, talk to you much more about is that we actually moved the classic, um, sorry for that, it was one too quick, the classic database access that we used to actually inherit from Seaside has now completely uh, been, or nearly completely uh, rewritten to be new managed code. And that is what has allowed us to introduce these new features and, um, uh, and, and optimizations. We still have, as you can see at the very bottom of, of the screen here, we still have actually some parts of the unmanaged code sitting in there, but we are constantly reducing that as we go ahead. What is query then? I bet you saw uh, some of the uh, overview diagrams on, on query in, uh, in the keynote today, but it really is about read-only access to data and about doing, having the database backend do what it does well, like joining and aggregations and groupings, all through a single uh, SQL select statement. That's the goal of the query. And really the ambition that we have with the concept of a query going forward is that that will be the way of accessing data in NAV. Um, so several years from now, the vision is that any code inside of NAV that reads data will be using the query concept and you'll only be using the, the traditional record API if you really need to update data. Another thing that we're envisioning is that we'll use query to also access other data sources. You'll see some demos here, maybe have seen before, where we externalize NAV data to the surrounding world. We're also planning on using query to consume data so that you can deal with data from external sources directly in CAL in very 
in a very easy way. Um, this translates into the CAL language. Of course, the query object needs to have a programming model. Um, and also, uh, this concept of a background session uh, that we are, are using in, in various aspects uh, has a set of, of uh, simple, really simple, I must say, uh, CAL functions to go with. And with that, I think the overview is done, and I'd like to hand it over to Badur. Thank you, Lars. <coughs> so this now I'll go through some examples of what, what does this mean to us, AL developers, um, because we have, and now we can solely focus on the SQL server. We don't have to worry about, does this also work on the native server? We have the query objects we can use to optimize some things, and we have the background sessions. These are new tools in our toolbox, or opportunities in our toolbox. So let's jump right into one of the examples that used to be a classic thing in the old native database. This is from our own upgrade tool uh, that we wrote. And the first, you know, in this case, while you read code, we have a situation where we want to update all entries in the item table that have either roll-up kitting pricing zero, or components on sales order zero, or, I mean, this oring thing, we haven't been good at oring, right? So previously it was common, okay, and actually this is the code we had, is, can you see the mouse here? You just loop through all items, and if the item is, you know, this or this or this, then we do something. Then you can choose a simpler thing or way to do this where you just modify all and set them to zero. Clean and simple. Or you can choose to filter, so you take all those who are not zero and then set them to zero, not zero, set them to zero. And there's a small program er programming error here because we should clear the filter after here, right? So what's the exec execution time here, you might think? Well, the original one, I mean, in our database, which doesn't have that many items, was 12 seconds. Just going to the simple one is actually twice as good on SQL. And filtering out is even a factor of five. So in this case, we have a factor 12 going from a bad pattern to a good pattern, an even, even simpler code, right? Another example is um, we are very often we iterate through some data, you know, set some filters, if find minus or find set, then, and then you re loop some through something. And this example, I'll do some summarization over some value entries, um, where I sum by item and document type, which are not in an index. I mean, well, they are in indexes, but not after each other. So we create our code, we create a temp table, a buffer table to hold the sums as we go through. And we have that uh, as a primary key, the thing we want to summarize by. We do a summarization function. And then this is a classic one, especially from the native database, right? You iterate through the value entry table. We set filter, I mean, in this case, seven star means you get uh, 860,000 out of a table of six million records. That's a lot, right? So the only difference between those two pieces of code is that in the la latter one, we have remembered to set the cur set current key. And if you remember from using the classic database, that is a huge difference in performance, right? So in this case, what? But now we are SQL, right? SQL doesn't care. Set current key only means something about sorting. So the first one takes, I mean, with my data, 74 seconds. Later one, 412 seconds. To me, that was a wow first time I saw that. Because remember, we don't care about which order uh, we take data here. And this difference comes from two things. One is that 
well, first of all, the first um, first iteration, we just tell SQL, go and use whatever order you want. We don't care. The second one, we ask it to sort the result set, which is big. Um, furthermore, since SQL Server has to sort results, the result set, it can't start delivering data to us until it has done all the uh, searching and sor sorting. And equally, if you set another filter, if you, in our data, you, uh, use one star, and then you get 2.4 million, and the numbers just increase. Now, I use this example, of course, because we've got the query object, right? Because today you wouldn't even need to do all this buffering thing. Um, you can just use a query, do set filter, and then open and read it, right? And that is, for this small sort set, uh, result set, it's slightly faster, but even it's still faster than any other option. With the many records, it's a lot faster. And I think I will, in case you haven't seen the keynote, I might just show you how simple it is to create such a query. So, so in our case, if you want to look through the value entries, you just choose value entry or write value entry. You select which fields you want. Item number, document type somewhere, and whatever, quantity or value quantity. I mean, the point is, so this is it. So if you want to summarize by these, then you, in the method type, write totals, and the total should be a sum opposite to count, average, mean, max. And that's it. This is how simply you write that. So if you store this as demo, take days one, One. You can even run this just to check the result. And this looks probably okay, right? So if you go back to the presentation. So this is, first of all, it's a lot easier to program this with the query. It's faster. And in this example, I used this uh, buffer, I mean, I added these numbers to the buffer, but I don't need to because they are already summed and sorted. So I can skip that line of code there. And then we have other, some other sh uh, features. Um, again, if you want to summarize by something odd, you know, in this case, we do a set range on some non-index field. We've actually, in 2013, we, are, we support calc sums, even though they're not in an SIFT index. It just gets slower, but it's still faster to ask SQL Server to do it than have all the data returned to the Nav server. Ryan, it's a factor, what is that? 20 something? So, the new features makes our code easier and faster. And then um, size matters. In this case, I took the item legend tables and just took some random fields. I took the first six, nine, and 12 fields, as you can see, and ran through our big database. And then I took, just took the item database, sorry, item legend entry record vari variable and iterated through that with a regular um, repeat until next. So you can see using a query, even in, this, in its simplest form, just re retrieve data is two or three times as fast as using the record set. 
Then another thing which is not so much to do with the server is that the client is a lot better at um, sensing that data has changed than the old classic forms were. So we have a lot of current page that update that we haven't cleaned out, and you probably haven't cleaned out either, which you could. And that reduces some workload on the, both on the server and, and on the network as well. And then this is more debatable. If you want to hunt the last 1% and you have some function you want to hand over an item ledge entry or value entry to, you can either pass it on as a variable, I mean as a value or as a reference, right, by var. And these two numbers here say, of, cor of course, tell you that by reference is, I don't know, 20 times faster. But still, the absolute numbers are very small. We are talking about five micros or six microseconds for the bad one and 300 nanoseconds for the fast one, which is very fast. I took this example because in 2009, we did the same, the, I haven't did measure, but the numbers would be in the thousands of milliseconds there. Um, because the data stack was written in unmanaged code, C++, and uh, this uh, interaction between the .NET and C the unmanaged code, having to instantiate record variables, was very expensive. So actually, even though you can see there's a big difference, this is very good news for code execution. So then we have something called start session, and I guess you have been pr presented to that already. But to those of you who haven't dived into this, think of it as a code unit dot run, except that it fires off in the background, it's uh, fire and forget. And you can, you get back um, the session ID, it's, uh, it gets when it started, you give it a code unit ID, company and record ID, very much similar to the um, code unit dot run. I mean, the co comma company name is a new thing. You can start a code unit in a different company in the background. And of course, it's controlled by permissions and so forth, of course. But that's kind of cool if you want to synchronize between companies or post across companies or whatever. Then it's, of course, great for offloading the user session. So very often you press some button and either the window freezes or you get a progress bar and then you can go and get coffee, right? So that's, that's all great. But you should remember that it has a cost. Um, it does cost an, a session in the NAV server, which again mean, may mean it takes a session towards the SQL server. It costs, um, Windows handle costs um, a Windows thread as well. It ha has to go through code in one to log in. It takes some memory, and fr from the code that instantiates, it takes perhaps 10 milliseconds to start, but on the server itself, it actually takes some more time. I could actually show you this with a couple of examples. So. So we have one example, which is update analysis views. If you run that, well, well, what this does is for each analysis view, it will call an, an update analysis view dot update function. And you can see here I have prepared it to do the same as in, a, in background. So if you run this from here, In, now, I have very small amounts of data, but in real life, this would take 
I don't know, half an hour, two hours, whatever. Top, done. But th this took a few seconds, right? So if I change this to use sessions instead. And before doing that, I just have to reset the analysis used because now they are updated and we have incremental updates of them. So let me reset. Now we go to update analysis use. Run the same again. Done, right? And it fires off stations in the background. And it's probably done already. Um, so another example, just to show what happens on the machine, is Here, we have a dummy code unit. All the only thing this done does is that it sleeps for 100 seconds, just so we have time to see what goes on. And then we have another code unit here, which starts up 100 of these, right? And when it has started them up, it will tell you that it has started them up. So if we, before we do that, we go to the sessions list here, List. And by the way, I have a NAS running and two NAS uh, back, uh, job queues running, and myself. And then we have the NAV server here. You can see currently we have 31-ish threads running on it, and some 800-something handles. So let's see how these numbers change when we start 100 sessions. I pressed run. So it's already done there, right? So it returns it very quickly. If we go here, session list, it's also done here. But if you get over to the Windows Task Manager, you can see it's only on 50. S I don't know if you can read this, but it counts up 59, 60. 61, 62. Can you see it? So even though the nav server thinks now it's done, it's it's on the way. The Windows system actually is still working on send, sending this off and having executed. And at some point, these have waited for 100 seconds and they will disappear again from this list. So this was just to illustrate that there is some cost and time associated with a background uh, service, oh sorry, background process. And taking this update of analysis use, you remember that towards the end of code unit 8090, we <coughs> have this code where we update analysis use and some companies have introduced death, death penalty for ticking off that they should be updated automatically. But this could actually have been done in the background. We chose not to for because then we are not exactly sure when it's done and what if two people post at the same time and we still put the work to the server and so on. Um, but this is just examples of how you could offload user um, tasks. So, to summarize, um, yeah, don't just use set range and update all instead of do having all those nexts and uh, loopy loopy. Use calc sums when you can. Use Don't use set current key unless you really want the result set sorted. Um, use uh, use queries for large data sets and go and clean up the current page dot update, which we have not done sorry 
And we have, haven't cleaned up the set current key either. But so is it time for some questions, perhaps? There's a good one then here. Uh, the question here is, how do the sessions count against the license? And the answer is, it doesn't. So that was a, was a good enough question. It was at least points for have, giving us the first Perfect. question. And a good one. And I have said it, so even though we have some marketing people here, they can't put a price on it now. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah. So the question is, what is the cost or the effort to move from 2009 to 2013, and is it worth the effort? Is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you ask me, the correct answer is yes, of course. Yes. I think, uh, <laughs> but it's worth mentioning here that uh, for, for this release, we have produced a lot of what we call uh, readiness material. <coughs> which is uh, specifically designed for people who know the old stuff. So what, did, what changed there, there, there off the word readiness, making you ready for, the, for this release. Um, so I think that's the... Uh, yeah, I mean, it also yeah. depends on how ready you are on 2009, because <coughs> a, big, a big task is to upgrade from forms to pages and the reports. And... I I think there is no correct answer. I mean, I would say yes, but uh, of course it's not me, it's not I who who pay have to pay the bills, right? So it's an easy answer for me. Uh, there's one. It's oh, should we? Uh, I think we can take one more and then maybe uh, wait. Yeah, maybe you should take one more. Uh, isn't on. Oh, yes, oh. This. Yeah. Um, I was wondering all these tips from what version can we start? Uh, do they uh, work like uh, not using set current key? Is it from, uh, from the set current key thing is, is actually a SQL thing? Yeah, so from any SQL version, no, th th this is uh, this is for uh, this is very mostly irrelevant for this version, so now yeah. 2013. For previous versions, uh, I would not uh, use this recommendation. Yeah, actually, Jesper is going through exactly this in pretty much detail in a second. Perhaps we should better test it ourselves. So, should okay, we can one left well, one. Yeah, this lady over here. Yes. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Th actually, that <laughs> that qualifies for a T-shirt. The, so the question is, if you can use background sessions for for uh, hand or offloading the user uh, to avoid locking, right? Lock and deadlock. And, and uh, is it going to queue? That's why I'm so happy about that question, because yes, you can use the job queue to do that, which runs as background sessions. So the job queue does not only run in background and offloads the user interface, but or, yeah, the user's interface, but it also serializes things. So if you go to the, I don't know if this was shown at the keynote, um, but if you go to the job queues, Job queues. 
So here we have set up two job queues, and we have defined these job queue category filter. So we have set one up to handle sales and purchase documents, because they often lock each other, right? And then one for other stuff. So if you look here, we can see that the job queue has something called this job queue category filter, and here it says, I don't know, can you read it? Sales post and purchase post. So what that means is if I go to the sales and receivable setup, we have this background posting thing here. And if I here say, oh, <coughs> all sales orders, I want them marked with the sales post tag. I mean, you can write anything here. You can just call them ABC or mail uh, handler or whatever you, have, you may have in your process. And you can tick off that you want posts. The when user press post in background, if, any, if you post post and print, it will in the foreground. And why, is, why this segregation? Well, the printer is on your client, right? Or the user's client. Whereas setting up print in background, which happens on the server, is a different thing. So that's why we have, uh, and you can, it can be made working, but it's not trivial. So we separated these th two. So if you go to sales order, and you create a new one, and to my favorite customer, And my favorite item. So if I press post here, so it's been scheduled for posting out, out of my way, right? And uh, similarly, uh, actually, if you think of the um, job queue in a very simple um, analogy, then think of your printer. If you have an office printer, printer is very slow, right? But it serializes the printing. So, so people press print and some sooner or later this each user's print will get out. So, ah, it's already gone. So if I go to the lock entries. Post sales order 2002, 1441, right? And that took, I don't know, less than a second. So, so yes, you can use background process to serialize work. And for that, I would say you should use the job queue. I think we should continue now, and we, because then we'll have questions towards the end. Otherwise, yes, but we'll run out of time. Okay, thank you, Bardo. <coughs> um, so I'm going to uh, talk about kind of the theory behind this. Uh, you already saw that uh, Bardo and his colleagues has gathered some uh, experience with, with these changes for NAV 2013, but uh, to be honest, there's still a, should we call it a big opportunity for you guys to, uh, to go and utilize some of the new stuff we have introduced here. Um, uh, and optimize uh, performance at uh, at customers, real customers. <coughs> so um, the new data stack is basically a complete rewrite of uh, of the code. Uh, some of you might know we had this NDPC SDLL, which was communicating with ODPC, and it's uh, and it's basically that whole thing that has been uh, rewritten. <coughs> and the new data stack is based on ADO. Uh, which is maintained by the SQL team and which supports new features like you know, transparent failover, always on, all that new uh, SQL, exciting SQL stuff coming out. Um, and all in all, uh, the new data stack uh, uses vastly less resources than, than the old um, and is faster even than the uh, that the classic uh, clients in uh, that's that's at least that's what our internal measurements show 
<coughs> and that's before we have started to use any of these uh, new features. That's just out of the box without doing anything. <coughs> um, as Lars touched upon, we have implemented the connection pooling uh, towards the SQL server. Uh, and what that basically means is that we have a, a, a pool of, of SQL connections. So instead of each user having its own connection, we have this, this pool. Um, <coughs> and we use one account for connecting to, uh, to SQL Server. This reduces memory you know, by, a, by an order of magnitude, memory which we can use for other things like you know, caching or temporary storage and stuff like that. Um, and to uh, basically ensure that we didn't get a performance degrade for this, we kind of have an internal concept where, where each user has like a preferred connection. So, so whatever connection the, the user was using the last time is the one he will get again, assuming he will do kind of this, the same type of work over and over again. Um, <clears throat> and it's that, that's as close as we can get to the, to the old behavior. But uh, it's just a preferred connection, so he might get a different connection which can be a challenge if you're, uh, if you're looking at things basically from, from the SQL side only. Um, as I just touched upon, we, we have a, a very much improved uh, caching mechanism, data caching mechanism. It, it works cross users. So uh, if one user reads all the items, or, uh, then other users won't go to the database. They will, they will uh, get, you know, leverage the data he just read. Um, Whereas in NAV 2009, this was done for each user. Um, and th it only worked in NAV 2009 by basically limiting, limiting the amount of data that, that we read. Um, but that limit is, is much higher now, and it's, it's shared across uh, users. And this goes for all record ABI uh, calls. So it's, it's find as well as find, find set, uh, get, calc sum, calc fields, and so on. They all. Uh, shove their data into a, a cross-user uh, uh, cache. <coughs> the only thing that we don't cache in 2013 is query results, unfortunately. Um, but um, fortunately, they are much faster to fetch in, in, in most cases. Um, with the older versions of NAV, it was pretty hard to figure out when the cache was actually uh, synchronized among users. In uh, NAV 2013, we have a very deterministic system for this, uh, where basically each NST notifies other NSTs about changes every 30 seconds. And uh, each NST listens for these notifications every 30 seconds. So within a minute, you're guaranteed that, that, that these changes are populated for, for all NSTs. Um, so that's about the best we can do. Um, uh, in terms of making a deterministic cache synchronization. Um, we have gotten rid of the, um, the old security models. We had the standard and the uh, enhanced security models before. That's basically gone, all that. Um, it wasn't really something that, that uh, you know, customers were caring a lot about in, in terms of, you know, the effect was the same. You, uh, you only had access to certain things and so on. So it was more from, from a database administrator perspective, it was in a new sense to have these uh, security models and you had to run synchronize all logins and all that. Um, and also we have gotten rid of this uh, extended store procedure that, you, uh, that was installed with the old versions. <coughs> One thing that's been, uh, been hard to cope with in, in previous versions of, of NAV was, you know, which find functions should I use? Should I use find minus? Should I find set? And so on. And I think the, uh, the recommendations have shifted a bit back and forth over the years. Um, and the reason why it was so hard is that was that we were using different cursor types and they influenced how SQL was fetching the data in different ways. Um, with uh, NAV 2013, we've gotten rid of the cursors. Uh, it means that um, now all these implicit rules about, you know, uh, with a dynamic cursor, I will mostly go for the index fitting the order by and all that stuff. 
is gone. Now SQL is free to go and, and choose the index that, uh, that's, that's best for the query. And that's why getting rid of, of set current key is now uh, possible without, you know, it, sh it should only have a positive effect now. Um, also, using curses is, is this whole special API on, on SQL Server that requires special calls and, and, and a lot of server round tripping, um, and uh, we, we've gotten rid of that. What happens with, uh, with these uh, multiple active result sets is that SQL Server spins up a, a worker thread to gather the data for a, a query and then start sending that over to the client. Um, the problem there with, with this new thing um, is that uh, it doesn't support dynamic result sets. Um, dynamic result sets is basically, if you start a, a, a f if you issue a find statement and you go next, 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 if you insert something within this loop further down in the result set, with NAV 2009 and also with 2013, we guarantee that you will see this data that you inserted. Um, this was handled by dynamic cursors previously. Now it's something that we need to, to take care of. And the way we do it is that we basically reissue the query if you start modifying the current uh, table that you're iterating through. Not if you update non-key non fields in the current record or you delete the current record or stuff like that, but if you start going insert, um, then it's hard for us reliably to analyze whether that insert uh, goes goes in further down your results. So basically, we, we reissue the query in, in those cases. <clears throat> One way to, to circumvent that problem is basically to use queries. They don't uh, guarantee a dynamic result set. Some of you might have heard about the uh, the range lock problem that we uh, that we are seeing with previous versions. <clears throat> And the range lock problem is basically that, that SQL Server can only lock physical objects in the index. Um, so if you locked all uh, lines on a given sales order, so basically you would go uh, lock everything with, uh, with document number 30 in my example here, then it would take the next index entry, lock that, and lock the first one that that satisfies the range. Because if it didn't take the next one, then potentially you could insert, you know, 30 line 9999, something like that. And uh, that's something that, that uh, SQL guarantees with their range lock policy that they, they, they gar uh, guard against. So that was why this was, was happening. We don't think that we need this capability from, from the application, to the best of our knowledge. And uh, this is guarantee all the way up to, to Badur. This should not be a problem. <laughs> and in any case, he would rather fight such problems than, than have this problem where we lock stuff that you know, wasn't requested by the user. Um, so we, what we did in 2013 is that we changed the isolation level from serializable to repeatable read. With repeatable read, we don't have these uh, range locks. Um, that being said, is actually not completely true because SQL Server can still, under the hoods, place range locks on SIFT indices. It's something we're working with them on, but you know it can still happen on uh, on SIFT indices when you modify, you know, a, a a, a larger set of records, for instance, you know, delete all or modify all or calls like that. <coughs> um, so yes, uh, another another thing that that changes when we shift from serializable to repeatable read is that we only lock the records that are actually present at the time where where the loop starts. Um, so say you lock all the, the lines on a, on a sales order, we have this auto split key functionality. So in, you know, someone could, in principle, if we didn't block it by other means, 
insert a line in between some of the existing lines. And all of a sudden, that line would appear when we were looping over this uh, stuff. That's a change with uh, when we go to repeatable read. That did not happen before. We've made a lot of improvements with regards to character data. We now support uh, Unicode in the database. Um, so you can store different languages in the same fields. Um, we made a change so that we now only support the latest Windows collations in SQL Server. Um, the reason is that those collations are compatible with Windows sorting. Um, which again means that we can do certain optimizations in the NST. Uh, for instance, if you go search something where, you know, larger than A, <coughs> and the platform when iterating through, you know, a page or something like places a filter saying, you know, I'm only gonna show something larger than B. Then we can compare those and then we'll just send the, uh, the filter saying larger than B to, uh, to SQL Server. And there are more advanced cases uh, where, where uh, uh, we saw some query runaways in, in SQL Server, which is avoided by, by making these optimizations in the NST. So basically, we don't ask for you know, queries with conflicting filters and stuff like that. We can do such optimizations now that we know that our comparison of character data is the same that SQL Server is doing. Um, during the, uh, the conversion from 2009, the, the database upgrade from 2009 to 2013, we do this whole conversion to Unicode. We, uh, um, we try to find the most appropriate Windows collation and also change that uh, in, in, in the uh, customer database, or everything in one step. So in a large, well, semi-large, uh, customer database we have at home, we use for a lot of testing, which is 50 gigs. I think we can, you know, on a, on a, on a plain uh, workstation, we can operate that in, in two hours. Yes, the, um, good question. <laughs> good question. Deserves a t-shirt, I think. <laughs> um, how large is the result is the, is the question. And uh, given that 70% um, of, uh, of fields in NAV are actually uh, text fields, that is either code or, or, uh, or text, uh, this means that data will, will grow to about you know, almost double size. Uh, but fortunately, uh, hard disk space isn't so expensive anymore as it used to be. <coughs> Um, we still only support one collation in SQL Server, which means that, that sorting and comparison and, and so on uh, only works for, you know, uh, typically one, basically one, uh, one country. <coughs> so even though you can store different languages, the sorting and all that w will only be even, uh, conforming with one, the rules in one country. Um, temporary tables, um, has been re-implemented as well, which means that we, um, uh, and because we can do this uh, similar sorting ourselves as SQL does, we guarantee that the, the, that the temporary tables are sorted the same way as, as uh, the C normal SQL tables, which they weren't before. Before it was some plain ordinal sorting. So this might cause problems in, in certain situations. It's something to be uh, aware of. <coughs> Similarly, uh, marked records used to be when you, when you were fetching records that were marked. Uh, we basically had a list of all the marks, and for each item in the list, we will go and fetch that record. We don't do that anymore. Instead, we try to send the, uh, the filter to SQL. If the, um, um, or we, we construct a filter from the marks. If you have a lot of marks, um, then we might, might not be able to send it in one statement, we might send two statements and, and so on, but you know, uh, many fewer uh, statements for fetching this stuff and, and the zoning is also uh, 
conforming with whatever current key you have um, when you do that. We use the, um, if you use the add operator, um, which means I want a case and accent insensitive uh, search, then we use the SQL collate keyword. So again, we, we respect all the different rules in different countries. Some of this information used to come out of the, the old STX files. Um, so you might see a change in, in that functionality. <coughs> We made some uh, improvements to uh, how calc sums and calc fields works. Um, we can use SIFT in more cases now than before. For instance, we can use it for count and average formulas. Um, as Badu had touched upon, we no longer require a SIFT index to, to be defined um, in order to do a, a, a calc sum or calc field calculation. <coughs> We use SQL Server min and max functions um, for min and max formulas. And uh, we made some improvements in, uh, with regards to the security system as well. Um, the, the old security system only had this mode where, where um, if you tried to access data that you did not have access to um, because it was restricted by security filters then we would uh, issue a runtime error for the user. We, we can still do that, but um, it used to be implemented uh, in a way where we basically traversed all the data and say, oh, do you have access to this? Do you have access to this? When you did a CACSUM call, for instance. Um, that's been changed so that we instead we basically look for any data that you shouldn't see and you're trying to access. So it's a maximum of two SQL calls now where it used to be this whole iteration thing going on. <coughs> and we have a new function in the language called set autocalc fields. It basically, um, the use of it is kind of like uh, set filter, set range. You, um, you set state on the record variable. And in this case, you set state about, I want these flow fields auto calculated as I fetch data for the for the table that's that's the idea um, and what what we do is we translate that into a single SQL statement uh, called uh, uh, that's something we internally called smart SQL so basically we we turn you know the the, the flow fields and all that into join statements <coughs> um, we also use this mechanism if you set a filter on a flow field, so say you only want to see customers with a balance greater than you know, 10,000 or something like that. Um, it used to be implemented so that we would you know, iterate, get, get a customer, calculate his balance. Is it within the filters? Then we return him, get next customer, calculate his balance and so on. Now it's you know, one big statement being fired. Um, <coughs> And this stuff is by default used in all pages in NAV 2013. So if you'll see these very large queries being fired from the system, <laughs> it's probably one of our smart SQL queries being fired. I've got an example here where we loop through customers we calculate the sales, and if the sales is you know different than zero, then we look at the balance and um, we we block the customer if he's uh, above some some limit here. This so this is 2009 code how how you would do that. Um, in 2013, we you can call set all the calculations of those two fields. And then you basically go find set, next, 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 and those, fi those fields are just calculated for you. Yes, I mean, there's no change in that. Um, it, the, oh, sorry, the question was, can you also filter on the calculated fields? You can filter on the calculated fields like you could in F 2009. And and that will use this mechanism. So even if you didn't call set autocalc fields, if you had a filter on a, on a calculated field, behind the scenes, we would auto-calculate it instead of using the old uh, algorithm. So one SQL statement in, in those cases. 
Um, <clears throat> we have this new thing called query that Lars touched upon, and we have seen it in the in the keynote. Um, and whenever we run a query, that's always translated into a single SQL statement. Um, and it's basically this new query engine is the underlying engine for, for the smart SQL, so the, so the auto-calculation of flow fields and all that. And it uses features that, that you can't even use yourself at the moment from the, uh, from the UI, so things like sub-queries and uh, constant column values and stuff like that needed to actually calculate our flow fields. <coughs> Sorry? Yes, they can. Uh, sorry, the question was, can queries use flow fields? And it's, uh, it's answered on, on this slide, which talks about uh, how queries embrace the old classic uh, nav constructs. So, for instance, shift uh, indices are used by queries. Whenever you do aggregation from a query, we will go and, and see if there's a shift index we can, we can use to satisfy that query. <coughs> uh, we have flow field support. Um, and it's th there are a few types of flow fields that we actually do not support from queries. Uh, we have these uh, fantastic features called values filter, for instance, uh, which is used in the uh, chart of account. <coughs> so basically, a field contains a filter, like I want to summarize from this account to this account. Um, that's kind of the only thing we, we do not support from, from queries uh, yet. We also have flow filter support. So if you um, if you add a flow filter in your query, then you can use that flow filter, for instance, in, in the join criteria between two data items. And also the flow filter uh, will be picked up and used in, in any flow field that you include in the query. Is there a paging mechanism from query? Paging mechanism from query? Um, so the question is whether we, we have a, an automatic paging mechanism. No, we, 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 I mean, it, it, it's basically the consumers of the query result that implement any paging going on. <coughs> no, the, 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 the correct. Um, the question is whether we we uh, we divide the results in SQL, the result we ask for, whether we try to 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 divide that into pages, and and we and we do not. We we ask for the whole result set from SQL, unless you use some of uh, you know, unless you use top, the possibility to get top x rows from from the query. <coughs> Yes, that's, that's correct. We have a, a session tomorrow. I'd like to make a small commercial here on use in, in data access where we're going to have to talk more about queries. But, I mean, today is kind of the, supposed to be the, the deepest dive into uh, to the different features. So, But this means that you'll have more time <laughs> to talk about these things tomorrow if we don't get to answer your questions today. Okay, go ahead. So, some index views. I mean, we use the indexed views to uh, to support the shift indices already today. Um, so, the gentleman is saying we cannot use them on uh, unless you're running enterprise edition, but um, we realize that <coughs> what, what you cannot do is this auto-matching. That's the thing that doesn't work on the non-enterprise editions. So, we couldn't just fire a, a query um, with aggregations and then expect SQL to use the shift index, you know, or the index view behind our back. 
So that's not what we do. What we actually do is we, we map, we, we go and point to the actual shift index we want to use, the index view, directly, uh, for the, exactly for, for that reason. We want to have this stuff run on, on any edition of SQL Server. Yes, so the question is, have we done anything in 2013 to do filtering in one column based on another? Say, I want all those where something in this column is greater than something in this column, for instance. And uh, uh, we, we do not have such a feature here in 2013, no. Um, the question is whether a regular user can define his own queries in, uh, in 2013, and the answer is no. This can only be designed in, in development environment currently. <coughs> a, a question on collation, yes? Yes. Yes. So the question is, w if you were using SQL collations with 2009 and you upgrade, will that cause any problems? And um, it, it shouldn't, unless we got it wrong. <laughs> uh, we basically try to find the appropriate Windows collation uh, to replace, replace the SQL collation, and then we upgrade to that. Um, but before the, the whole database uh, technical upgrade, uh, Fires, we will actually present you with a, with a choice where we show you, we've chosen this collation, do you want to continue? So you can, if it's not the collation you were expecting, then you can stop it right there and, and, and make changes before you convert. Because uh, the, you, you, can, you can use the old classic client to choose whatever collation you, you would like before upgrading. Um, <coughs> some, some notes here on, uh, on things to consider with regards to queries and performance. Um, unfortunately, it's not, uh, not a free meal here either. Um, so for instance, query results are not cached. Um, <coughs> so if you're fetching data through the normal record ABI and you're basically fetching the da same data over and over again, then, then queries might not be able to compete performance-wise. Um, because that result is not cached. Uh, queries are not guaranteed to, to deliver a dynamic result set, so it, mi it, it might not contain any changes that you make while you iterate through the query results. Um, we don't guarantee that it, that it won't, and we don't, don't guarantee that it will contain these changes. It's basically up to whatever plan SQL Server uh, decides on. Um, ordering of tables in a query definition does matter. Um, we uh, started off uh, using queries uh, in, in, a, in a few places in the application, uh, and it turned out that, um, that there was a few cases where SQL actually you know, came up with a, a completely um, bad plan. Um, I mean, SQL make these decisions on whether to go this way or this way based on statistics. And if you have, th you know, data that's not distributed evenly, then sometimes uh, SQL don't make the, uh, the right choice. So for this version, we have had to uh, actually add hints for the queries. So we ask SQL to use a nested loop plan. So inside SQL does, inside SQL it will you know, take table A, one record, then go and fetch for, for table B and C and so on. This will happen inside SQL. Um, we force it to do that. And we force it to use whatever order you've defined in the query. So you know what's going on. It's still way faster than doing this in, uh, 
in normal code because all this stuff is going on inside SQL. Um, and you know, if, if it's a query that needs to filter out a lot of records, this will be an order of magnitude faster still. The question is, um, previous versions, you could actually force it to use certain hints for certain uh, fine statements. Um, and um, it's something that we, uh, that we didn't find useful for this version. Um, it's, um, it would kind of defy this whole idea about letting SQL choose itself. So, so we don't support that uh, for this version, not for the normal rec record API, no. <coughs> Um, buffered inserts, if you don't know uh, what it is, I'll give, give you a short introduction here. Um, it basically means when, when you're doing multiple insert calls, uh, we don't actually send them to the database as you uh, issue them. Instead, we, 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 we buffer them up and send them in chunks to uh, SQL if possible. And previously, stuff like uh, if a table contained a record ID or a SQL variant, um, we would not be able to, to do that, but we can in, in, in this uh, version. Uh, I'd just like to highlight it here because buffered inserts can, can vastly decrease uh, blocking um, because it basically weights with the inserts and thereby causing the, the, the blocking in the sifting disks to a, to a later point in time. Um, The old client monitor uh, feature was not part of um, NAV 2009, and it's not part of NAV 2013. Um, <coughs> instead, we have introduced a new feature where you can basically ask for um, getting the SQL that we sent instrumented with your AL call stack. Um, so especially for real SQL pros, they can kind of, you know, they will get information in the SQL profiler about who fired the statement, where did it come from, this piece of AL code, and, and, and so on. And you enable this feature in the uh, normal debugger uh, UI. <coughs> you can basically enable it for all users, or you can enable it for that single complaining uh, user that's, that seems to be running into uh, performance problems. And if you do enable it, uh, and you start the profiler, you would get something like this, uh, where basically we send us a, 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 a SQL statement which doesn't contain anything but a comment explaining from which AL code this statement was coming. Um, and we recently put out a, a blog post which can take an output like this, and so you basically get a line saying, you know, this is the SQL statement, this is the user, this is where it's coming from uh, in AL code, and then you can go and do analysis uh, on that. This was about it for, from me. Um, it seemed like there were more questions, so... Uh, Um, so, so question is, uh, with our buffered inserts mechanism, uh, if you see an insert call in code and you're debugging through it, w and, and we are trying to insert, for instance, a duplicate key, will you, will you get the error there or, or later? And I actually believe that when the debugger is running, we disable uh, buffered inserts, but I'm not 100% sure. If we don't, um, then we have a, an option in the uh, server config file where you can completely disable buffered inserts for debugging purposes. Buffered inserts is not something new by itself, no. It was in 2009 as well, um, but um, we can use it in more cases now. That kind of, that's kind of the news. <coughs> if 
There's no one here. Just turn all three. <laughs> yeah, thank you. The question was, what happens when a background process, uh, no, not a background process, or job queue entry, What, which one? Yeah, background session, yes. Um, I guess it, it depends on also what, what you mean by a crash. Uh, what? Like an error. Yeah. In, in the AL code. Good. Yeah, you can see that in the, we have a table here, here, which is called session event. So if you run this table, you can see all a lot of um, log in, log out, log in, log out. But here, you see a comment, right? So for instance, here you can see that this, session was started by session four, but if it crashed, it will tell you out here as well. And this is a table that is accessible from anyone. In the job queue, we have error handling, so that will be logged in the job queue log entry, and you can have not notifications sent to the user and so on. Um, if you go to the, but that's of course something we implemented for specifically the job queue. So we have this called my notification part here. And if uh, if you've sent a, po a sales po sales order to be posted in background job queue and it fails, uh, which it does sometimes because you forgot to fill in some shipment date or whatever, it will, it will show up here. Moreover, we have a Customize this page, my job queue. Left and move, go away. Actually here, if you, let's say you are a fast worker and you send a lot of jobs ahead which just are queued up, then they will s you can see them here and you can also see if they failed and you, I mean, imagine that you had jobs here and you could click on one of them and then go to the actual sales order that failed. You can fix fix the error and restart it, or just post again. But uh, but more generally, if um, if it f if a session a background session fails, it's the other table I just showed you, the um, session event table. Yes, the question is on the sales orders, uh, what happens when you put it to the job queue and it hasn't been posted yet? Is there a status or does it disappear or what? And actually that has fluctuated a bit over time. What we ended up with, because in the first, um, first incarnations you would call it, it just disappeared because that would appear natural and then it reappeared when it failed. But then, let's say that the NAS dies somehow, you know, the machine crashes, and then who, who will bring it back to life? So we ended up just having this uh, job queue status here. So if I choose a random order, which probably fails because I haven't done some warehouse working work or whatever, I post, uh, post, yep. See, schedule for posting, right? And if the sub error, darned. Um, nothing to post. You can see there's a, it's an underline there, right? So if you go over here, you can also see, ah, it's a red error. And you see, um, show, the, show me the error, nothing to post. Go to record, um, navigate, give me the order, and I can do the warehouse working if that's what I wanted to do. Um, 
we have time, I could quickly show you what... Uh, are most of you AL developers? No? Some of you. So, <laughs> so what happened, you know, if you're an AL developer you and you've ever been near a sales order, you know that when you press this post thing here, right, this one, you invoke code unit 81. 81. This is the one that asks you this yes, no question. Do you want to ship and so on. So what you do here is, can you read the code? Yep. So if the setup is says post to the job queue, then we enqueue the sales header with this special code unit. Otherwise we do as we used to. I mean, this is what it used to look, li look like. And then if you look into this, guy, press control F12, you're into this function. Oh, by the way, did you see this? Is, it, is this new or or is it new in, in R2 also? Yeah, isn't it nice? Um, you can see here we fill in a job queue entry and basically you just start this job queue, NQ thing. So this is what it takes to to put a sales order to the job queue. Um, I don't know if that was helpful at all. Yes and no. Uh, so the, the question is, in the, the job queue, does it handle um, the entries of the jo jobs in order? And yeah, I mean, yes and no. Not, not necessarily chronological order. Did you have it here? No. Uh, sales. Actually, we were debating whether that was a T-shirt question, but I think not. You might have to come up with some something better, some dirty question. Like, um, so for instance, so the, to answer the previous question, we have something called priority, and we here we set it randomly to a thousand. I mean, it's just an integer, and that's what me what it means. So if you have some other task that is inserted to the job queue with. Uh, Low, I mean, a lower number. Pardon? Yes. Then all. Then purchase. Yes. Then purchase. It. So the question is, if it takes purchase orders, and has set them to 100, or 999, then the answer is yes. Then purchase order will get in front of the queue. Yeah. Yeah, if I would say the question is if there's limited inventory, and yes, then the if they run the same priority as here, then it would be the um, the one who press post first who will win. But if that's an issue, I think they will use reservation or something, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um that has also been deb debated of how we should handle that. So what we do is if you send Sorry, the question is, if, it's, if we have a long queue or an empty queue that is stopped a bit, n no, and you send your order to the job queue, can anyone change it while it's there? Well, what we do is, when you put it to the queue, we assume you want to post it, right? So therefore, we release it. And hence, no one can just change it. But yes, theoretically, if they're quick, they can go and 
and um, reopen it, change something, and send, um, release it again. But I mean, but that's no different if you from earlier where you had a batch job, right? A batch post where you press batch post, which would then post hundred of orders. Then you could be quick and change, you know, some of the last orders, right? So the, well, if I may rephrase your question, um, have we done any changes to the business logic of a sales order because of uh, job queue? The answer is no. It works exactly as before. So availability and so on, that's first come, first serve, or whatever it was before. Yep. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. Do, do we have two people asking at the same time now? I think didn't we have microphone as well at some point? Just take the, this one first. Okay. Yeah. Is that a t-shirt question, you think? Yes, I think so. Um, so I, I, I think, the I think correct me if I'm wrong, I think the question was about our cash synchronization mechanism. Yeah. Correct? Yes. How it works, what, <coughs> what message is sent, and yes. how it is sent. Yeah. Telepathy or some other so system? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so, the, the, so the point of the caching uh, synchronization mechanism is to keep the different Navision servers up to date with what is in the database. Um, so the, 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 the way we actually synchronize them is through a table in the database where we simply write version numbers. Um, so whenever one NST changes a table, we increment this uh, version number and then other NSTs will go and, the, and check this version number from time to time and thereby discover that uh, uh, something changed in this table uh, and they will uh, flush their cache the for that particular thing. That's how it works. Um, Follow-up question for that. Couldn't that be heavy on uh, the writer on the database? On the writer in the database, whether this is this heavy on him? Well, we only update this table every 30 seconds. So all this information is kept in memory and only flushed every 30 seconds. So should, should we take one last question? Because I think we're over time. So we might be able to, to take one last question, yes. Otherwise, we'll get kicked out. But we'll be at the expert lab, right? Pardon? Yes. Ah, um, yeah. Uh, we the last question gets the t-shirt, right? Yeah. So who says job queue posting? So the question is, the question is, is job queue posting a good feature? Yes, it is. <laughs> no, sorry. Just kidding. Okay, uh, this uh, job queue posting, in my understanding, it's improving the system resp responsiveness, um, the maybe user interface, but uh, it uh, doesn't improve performance at all, isn't it? Or am I missing something? That is absolutely correct. Putting mm -hmm. anything Isn't to the back. Thank you. Sorry, the question is. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the question is. Thank you. Posting anything in job queue or anything, does it improve performance? Technically, no. You just put it out of the user's way, right? Out of his face. It's just like a printer doesn't get faster just because you have a server queuing stuff up for you, right? Yes. And in, in fact, I'd like to mention, when, now that we're talking about it, that you know, starting all these extra processes might actually slow down the server. Yep. But at least the users won't have to, to sit there and wait for the posting to uh, complete. No.